and get started. Um, just a brief note, we are recording this presentation. Um, our Some of our committee members are not able to uh, view live, so we are going to be sharing it with them um, post-meeting. And I will turn it over to our committee chair, um, Jennifer mixes -Olds. Uh, hello, good afternoon, or good morning, or evening, I guess, depending on where you are tuning in from. Um, uh, before we get started, I just want to thank everybody for their time to share their thoughts on this topic. Um, my name is Jen mixes Olds. I'm at the University of New Hampshire, where I am the director uh, of the Center for Acoustics Research and Education. Um, I have been asked to serve as the chair on this National Academies panel titled Committee on Ocean Acoustics Education and Expertise. Um, this particular um, activity today is a workforce information gathering panel. And so we, this will be split, and I think Caroline will talk a little bit more about this, but it will be split into two different panels, one for government and one for non-government entities. So jumping right in, because we want to give everybody more time to talk than to listen. So if we can go to the next slide. The goal for today's meeting really is to collect information and perspectives from all of you um, as both individuals and as representative of your organizations to inform our report that we will write on this topic. Here we're um, going to hear from speakers in the ocean acoustics workforce, both governmental and non-governmental. Things that we will be asking questions and um, topics centered around experience, obtaining and training their own workforce and thoughts on future direction um, of their workforce in relation to the topic of ocean acoustics. We can move to the next slide, please. I don't do this alone. Um, so I want to um, very much uh, introduce, they're, they're not gonna introduce themselves, but acknowledge the different committee um, members on the panel. There's Andrea Anguelas from Penn State University, Art Baggerer from MIT, Yusil Hodling from Eidos Education, Rujan Lee from the University of Washington, Carolyn Ruppel from US Geological Survey, Gail Scowcroft from the University of Rhode Island, and Preston Wilson from the University of Texas, Austin. I'd also like to point out Carolyn Bell, who is our point of contact through the National Academies and the National Academy staff that is working with the committee um, to generate this report. I think everybody but Art Bagger from the committee is on today, correct? So the statement of task, I'm not gonna read this all to you. You should have each gotten a briefing um, booklet, but I do want to highlight four things. So this statement of task requests a report written by the committee covering four specific topics. The first is the state of education in ocean acoustics. The second it is examination of workforce demand around the topic of ocean acoustics. And I'm also gonna add into that and supporting disciplines. Ocean acoustics does not um, exist in a vacuum. There are many different supporting disciplines that contribute to ocean acoustics, um, such as technology, signal processing, and so forth. So that is all gonna be considered under the larger umbrella of supporting ocean acoustics. Um, the third statement of task is to really understand the skill sets or competencies needed to meet the current ocean acoustics and supporting disciplines demand and the future demand. It's these numbers two and three that I think this panel will be able to provide us um, expert opinion and information on. The fourth statement of task item is to look how the needs that are not being met can elevate, can be elevated in order to raise the profile of careers in ocean acoustics across all stakeholders and sectors. Anybody have any questions on the statement of task before I move forward? Because this is an important one. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And so this is how um, our report 
is going not to be structured, but will incorporate information on academic institutions that offer courses in ocean acoustics and supporting disciplines. That is not this information gathering panel, but will be the topic of an additional one. Public and private sector professional level organizations that require expertise in ocean acoustics as part of their operations. You guys can speak to this firsthand. Ocean acoustics workforce needs in key sectors industry. I think we're gonna talk a lot about that today. Training programs currently available in key regions. That may or may not come up today, depending on how the different organizations that we um, have participating in this panel answer questions and examples of current ocean acoustic programs, which will be the topic of a survey that is going out to the acoustic community and another um, information gathering panel. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Oh, that's your slide. All right, thank you, Jen. Um, so just a few meeting logistics for everybody. Um, I think everyone is, is keeping on this as Zoom is kind of the new norm for a lot of meetings. Please mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, use the raised hand feature to ask a question or the chat in Zoom. We will be, um, as we get to the Q&A panels, uh, committee members' questions will be prioritized and Jen will be uh, moderating the, the, the questions with Academy staff assisting. Um, and then please uh, turn your cameras on when you're speaking. Um, and we, as I had mentioned um, at the beginning, but for those that just joined, we are recording the uh, session for committee members who um, are unable to attend. Next slide, Eric. And just a brief agenda. Um, we're gonna start with the federal agency panel, and then we'll have a period for question and answers, and then we'll go into um, the industry, re industry and research panel um, and time for questions for, for those speakers. And so with that, um, Eric, if you want to end the slide, and we will um, welcome Jen, uh, Jill Lewandowski from BOEM to begin um, our panel. Let's see, you are muted. Jill, as Jill unmutes um, each person, are we going to do, we're just going to do the, the governmental pattern panel introductions first, or do we want to do all panel introductions? Um, I was going to just go through person by person. Okay. So go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you for joining okay. us. Yeah, great. So hi, uh, Jill Lewandowski. So I currently uh, work for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. And um, I wear kind of two hats. I oversee our environmental assessment work from a national perspective. And I also direct our Center for Marine Acoustics. And I wanted to sort of start um, in this presentation by uh, talking a little bit about, um, I'm not sure why this is not, there it goes, it's probably gonna, I wanted to sort of just start real briefly with Bohm's mission, just so you can get an understanding of where we're coming from when it comes to acoustics. So we have a purpose of managing development of energy and minerals offshore. Uh, which in this case is oil and gas, it's any kind of renewable energy, uh, marine minerals, which is often uh, sand mining for beach and coastal wetlands renourishment. And we also have a carbon sequestration program coming on board. Um, but we're, we're meant to do it in an environmentally and economically responsible way. So I work obviously in that environmentally as aspect, trying to um, apply that across a, a variety of things, but it's a big mission because right now we have about two over about two and a half billion acres that we manage um, in the outer continental shelf. And of course, we just did get extension to look at renewables in some of the U.S. territories as well. To give you a sense, you know, noise producing activities happen across all of those program areas. I noted activities and every sort of phase of each of those activities, um, anywhere from air guns and geophys other geophysical sources to pile driving to dredging, explosive, explosive. So we have a lot of activities that uh, we, we manage and we're sort of in a unique role where we regulate it. Um, but we're also regulated to some extent, for example, under the Endangered Species Act, which is a federal to federal statute where um, we work closely with NOAA and Fish and Wildlife 
um, and they may regulate us and, and um, ask us to provide and apply some provisions to activities that we authorize as well. And to give you another sense of just the space we're working on is it's very, it's not just a science issue, right? It's also a policy issue. Uh, this is a little flavor of some of the big uh, statutes that we deal with. So any activity we have that's producing noise is going to have to uh, be considered, you know, under the ESA, the Marine Mammal Protection Act. If it's a near or in a sanctuary, it's the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, um, essential fish habitat. So um, there are a lot of places where we have to sort of consider noise within our kind of regulatory structure and review. So back in December of 2020, we created or formalized what we're calling the Center for Marine Acoustics. Um, and it's not to say it's a new issue for us because the earliest study that Bohm did on acoustics in the, was in the late 1970s um, up in the Arctic. And uh, there were studies throughout the 80s and 90s, but I think acoustics as sort of a controversial issue um, elevated to, uh, across our programs, mainly oil and gas, started really happening in the early 2000s. And for the longest period of time, uh, we didn't have anybody that had acoustic expertise. Um, I came to it and learned it on the job. Um, the person that joined me shortly, uh, a number of years later, also uh, had learned it on the job versus some formal training. Um, but now we're starting to see programs that are uh, really uh, training uh, individuals to come to the workforce with, with those skills and knowledge in place. But to focus on what our purpose is, is uh, we are working on modeling. Uh, so we're trying to do uh, a soup to nuts model, looking at you know sound source propagation, impact assessment, um, applying relative risk frameworks. So we're also working with our science or environmental studies program within BOEM, as well as um, other partners to fill data gaps and identify new ones as well. Uh, policy is a heavy component. Uh, messaging, trying to improve our stakeholders' understanding of actual risks. Uh, I think we all know there's a lot of um, misconceptions out there about noise and, and what it means on, as far as impacts go. And of course, we're very, very, very much partnership focused. So our Center of Marine Acoustics right now, I serve as the center director. We have four team members on our bioacoustics team, and we have three more um, on our physical acoustics and modeling team. Over on the right there, I just wanted to sort of capture uh, relative to this discussion, I noted myself and one other person, we sort of learned the acoustics on the job. Um, my background is environmental science and policy and, you know, uh, but I did not uh, step into acoustics until I joined the government in the early 2000s. But the remaining six are in early mid-career. Uh, you know, we had one that came to us during her doctorate program right at the end. We had two that came right uh, during or following a postdoc, uh, three that came to us from consulting. Uh, mainly uh, organizations that do modeling or actually do field measurements on acoustics. Um, the education varies, but I gave a little bit of a flair as far as the eight individuals that we have in the center, what their uh, advanced degrees were in. And it goes across the board from straight up on acoustics to you know, applied mathematics to conservation medicine and zoology to policy and science, uh, ocean engineering. So I think just seeing where people came to us with the kinds of degrees they have gives an indication of the, the sorts of needs we have from an education perspective. And then my final slide is just to share some observations. Uh, one of them is uh, something I've touched on already. I think in the past people learned on the job, but I think now we're seeing more and more graduate programs that are actually, um, you know, training folks up in various aspects of the physical, biology, and the policy side of the issue. Um, I do see that a bit more in the graduate level, not so much in the undergraduate. So I, I do sort of wonder if there's space there to grow uh, and perhaps engage and, and treat people to um, start earlier and, and maybe get more people into the field. It does require lots of buckets, buckets of expertise. 
I think it's difficult for anybody to come into us with just one of these buckets. I think I know when I hire, I'm looking for people that are able to operate in more than one. So they're a little more interdisciplinary in some aspects. Um, and that's largely because we don't have the resources to fill each X bucket with expertise. Um, and so a competitive applicant is going to be somebody who um, is not just a physical scientist or a biologist, but they can also operate, uh, they've learned through education or they've shown through on the job work that they can operate in more than one of these buckets. It's a small but growing applicant pool. I, I look back, like if I could use the like aquatic noise conferences as a as a judge, um, a gauge, I guess, when I look at the one in Cork, Ireland, that was oh probably 12 years ago. And it was such a small group there into what we see now, where it's gone from maybe 75, 80 people to you know, three, four hundred and lots of students showing up. Um, so that's great. I think that's indicating that more and more people are getting into the into the field, but it's still a limited um, number of applicants. When we post a job, um, we probably get, you know, less than 10 that have in the bioacoustics and even smaller than that on the physical acoustics and modeling. And that might just be a desire not to go to the federal government. Um, it's hit or miss. Sometimes we've put out an advertisement and we've had a great number, uh, a great, um, even though it's a small pool, it's a, it's a really, um, there's some great people in it. And other times we've put it out and there's nobody we even want to consider. So it's a, it's a little bit hit or miss. And I would say, I know we've taken people from other organizations and I suspect that'll happen um, to us also at some point in time. So we are competing for the same people. I think that the one area this field uh, critically lacks is, is that whole messaging piece. Like how do we outreach, educate, communicate, um, have experts in those areas or, or training in those areas um, that can allow, you know, a physical acquisition to be able to communicate and educate at the appropriate level, um, or people who just can can understand the the science and the technical technical piece of it and do a good job at that. Um, and it's as we know, it's not just one level, right? So we need to talk to uh, people we regulate. We need to talk to uh, the general public and families that come to public meetings. Uh, we probably need to get into the education system, K through 12 as well, and really start giving folks a better understanding of um, ocean acoustics and maybe get them interested at an earlier age. I, I also, just wanted to jump in and ask if you could wrap it up so we could have time for committee questions. Yep, great. So the last two, I'll just pop up here. Um, you know, it's difficult the federal government to get the FDE, to get the budget for the FDEs. It took probably about eight plus years of rallying until we finally were able to get that in, in, in BOEM. And then the last point I would make is it's very limited diversity in the field. And if there's a way that this committee can kind of think about how can we reach um, more diverse candidates and get to um, communities that are, are generally underrepresented in this field would, would be, um, I think, a really great um, direction to head. And that's it. So I will unshare. Awesome, thank you, Jill. We're gonna to move to Mike Jack for his introduction of yourself and your organization. Would you like to share or will you do the slides? It'd be coming up. Awesome, okay. Um, so my name is Mike Jack. I'm with the uh, NOAA Northeast Fisheries Science Center in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And uh, just to give you a quick background, I'm a biologist by training who got into using underwater acoustics in graduate school. And, uh, but over the years, I've interacted with many acousticians, physicists, engineers, and, and there's a learning curve there from a, from a biological background to dealing with people of more, more um, engineering type backgrounds. And uh, my, my expertise is in active acoustics in the water column. So that's what my background is. And I try to give, uh, you can go to the next slide. I try to give a background of um, all NOAA, but uh, I just, I made this um, slide many, many years ago and you can tell that because it says voltage on it rather than something else. But um, this is just to, to show 
and remind myself that, you know, the acoustics is multidisciplinary as we find out. There's electronics, there's engineering, there's acoustical physics, there's the biology and ecology if you're looking at water column, but you can substitute that fish for seabed, reefs, wrecks, navigational charts, all different kinds of things. It's something in that underwater environment that we're trying to learn. And that all goes up into visualizations and computer science. And now what we're seeing a lot is with the data analytics. Um, we've collected a large number of data over the years and decades. And so now what do we do with those data? And within NOAA, as Jill said, we're, we're providing information for, for the public good. Um, next slide, please. So that's really our goal. So, um, you know, there's a broad spectrum of applications of underwater acoustics in science, and that is reflected in the uses within NOAA. Uh, so I, I'll try to, I'll probably give a short shrift to most, most of our programs in NOAA. And, but also it's, a, it's an applied approach um, within, I don't know, within the government, but certainly within NOAA, we focus primarily on applied applications or applied approach versus basic research. Um, kind of the basic workforce structure, there's, you know, there's tech level support um, that do a lot of the technical level kinds of things, calibrations, post-processing data, organizing ancillary data, as, we, as, as Jill said, there's a lot of other data that goes into this. Uh, we have software specialists, uh, they develop software for processing data, databases, data analysis. What I can say they don't often do is they're not um, into the true signal processing of the echo sounders. And, and it's much the same way with the hardware engineers. Most of the hardware engineers are developing hardware for related activities, calibrations, or other types of things. But uh, we've kind of left the development of the echo sounders and transducers to the, to the industry. Uh, which you'll probably hear about quite a bit in the next panel. And that's there's benefits and there's also limitations to that, uh, to, to having made that or having come to that, if we made the actual decision or not, but that's what it tends to be. And then we have research personnel um, developing new analytical methods, interacting with assessment and ecosystem sciences, and for trying to direct how that information reaches the public and to the managers. Uh, next slide, please. So I, this is just a short list of things that came to my head when I was looking at that I know, acoustic activities in NOAA. I'm in the fisheries, NOAA fisheries or National Marine Fisheries Service, NIMS. Um, the living marine sources, you know, we, that's where we use active acoustics primarily. Um, that's where we're generating estimates of abundance and biomass for stock assessment and ecosystem-based management. So most of our data, or not all of our data, goes into stock assessment or ecosystem works. Or mapping distributions of fish and plankton, and important, we're map, we're uh, creating, we're doing aerial surveys, so surveys over often broad areas at regular intervals. So it's not continuous data collection. Um, within the organization of NIMS, there's protected species, and that's primarily where we get into the passive acoustic monitoring, um, and that's where you're monitoring the spatial temporal distributions of of the animals that are making sounds, mainly mammals but there are fish. Um, and one difference from the living marine resources is that they're continuously collecting data at selected sites though. So you have point data, but over time, time series of data. And of course, and acoustic telemetry, and that's primarily used a lot for protected species like salmon, sturgeon, some of the larger fish where they're trying to get migratory patterns of, of, uh, of, the, of the species uh, and, and mammals also. Um, again, they're, they're looking at the spatial temporal distributions of fish and mammals at selected sites. Next si slide, please. Uh, we also have the National Ocean Service, and that's really where the bathymetric mapping for navigations and charting comes from. So they have a whole, that's a whole separate branch from our division section of, of NOAA, and that's really, that's what their bread and butter is bathymetric mapping, um, and they have a whole field for that. But there's also a biological component, uh, habitat mapping, where there's benthic and pelagic ma uh, mapping. Uh, there's also a lot of work with reefs and wrecks and other anthropogenic features that are put into the ocean. That's a lot of where um, that work is done within NOS. And then there's a small, small contingent of people in, it's called Oceanic and Atmospheric Research, which is OAR. And they deal primarily with ocean exploration. So they're out in deep water typically like in mesopelagic regions or um, deep coral reefs and other things, uh, a lot of remote vehicles. Um, and then we also have the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations, OMAO. Um, 
And OMAO doesn't necessarily do the acoustics, but they're responsible for the platforms where we have all our acoustic instrumentation. Most of those are crude vessels now, but they're getting into remote and autonomous vehicles. And um, we also have the survey techs that often conduct or assist with calibration of the acoustic instrumentation of the platforms. And they also deal with the at sea data management. So that's really where the, that's where the data are collected is out on these platforms. And um, I will say that the expertise in that, in that um, division is, is low. They, they really could stand to have more, more uh, expertise in that division. Um, and then lastly, we have the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service, which is NESDIS. And this is important because that's where all the NOAA acoustic data are archived. It happens the facility in Boulder, Colorado, but they are responsible for Make, uh, archiving the data, but not only that, but making the data discoverable and available to everyone in the world. And it really is, those data are used by people from around the world. Next slide, please. Uh, just to go over the topics, I think Je that Jennifer mixed. Um, I won't go, I'll skip number one. I can echo what Jill said a lot of this, but um, the demand is really the technical level support. We need, that's one of the levels, so we have, fair number of PhDs and masters, but we, we do have technical level support. And one of the issues with technical level support is that they often end up in dead end careers, uh, especially at the, with the at sea data collection. It's really, really, really hard to retain people and recruit people for those. And that's what a lot of NOAA does. We collect a lot of data at sea and it's very difficult to, make, to keep those people. As I said before, the big data analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, that's really kind of the growing area for on the research side of things. As we're collecting more and more data, not from just the crude vessels, but from autonomous platforms, and we, we've really given short shrift to data management and IT needs. That is a critical infrastructure need that, that is very necessary, that, that gonna have to get some attention before we uh, move forward. Okay, next slide. Mike, if you could wrap up, please, so we can um, give some time for questions. And I'll just uh, just go back to kind of echo what Jill said. There, there's just the training and can you continue education is key, especially for that technical level, um, the, the, the technical level people, because that's we got to. There's we really need that level of people, and we need, we need to be able to retain and keep them. All right, that's that's all I have. Thank you, Mike. It was great that you tied it right back to the statement of work item. So thank you very much. Um, the last person on our federal government panel is Brian Houston, and you can um, introduce yourself and your organization. Thank you. Hi, folks. Uh, Carolyn, I sent you a package, uh, both a PDF and a PowerPoint in the last few minutes. Can you grab that or should I drive it from my slides from my machine? You're muted. Thank you. Um, if you would, uh, oh, yeah, if you wouldn't mind pulling them up if you have them handy, um, otherwise the, the email did just pop in. I was going to say, Brian, why don't you just introduce yourself and then Caroline, you can get the, the slides going while he introduces himself and where he's yep, from. Here, here we go. I've got them up now. Go ahead, Brian. Okay. So um, my name is Brian Houston. I'm with the Naval Research Lab. And uh, Naval Research Lab is located sort of splattered across the, the country. The main campus is in Washington, D.C., um, Stennis Space Center, there's a large complement of us down there. We are also on the West Coast in Monterey. Um, so uh, if you go to the next slide, um, NRL is a basic and exploratory focused, uh, research focused organization. Um, originally started about 100 years ago by uh, Alexander Graham Bell, urging the federal government uh, that it needed a, a, an s and laboratory uh, for its Navy because of all the new technology that was being generated. So most of our folks are practicing scientists. We publish in the open as well as we have closed publications for things that are more classified. About a thousand PhDs 
um, a lot of patents and publications. Um, if you don't remember anything about the Naval Research Lab, just remember that it's the place where the global positioning system was invented. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, so um, there are about uh, 16 uh, divisions in the, uh, at the laboratory. Uh, the acoustics division is highlighted in red. It is um, uh, under the Ocean Atmospheric Science and Technology Directorate, uh, currently, uh, currently headed up by Doug Todorov. Um, next slide. So inside the acoustics division, we have five uh, main research areas, what, what I call strategic research areas. Ocean acoustics, ocean and atmospheric acoustics, the dominant one, of course, is ocean acoustics, is the first one. It's also the dominant um, uh, research area. Uh, physical and structural acoustics, undersea signal processing, autonomous and distributed systems, and then advanced mater materials for undersea warfare. Um, ocean acoustics embeds everything else. It's intertwined in all these other uh, core strategic research areas. We do mostly basic and applied research, but we also go all the way to the fleet. So much of, uh, a lot of our research, researchers do work at the very basic and exploratory level, but many of them are out on uh, Navy gray ships as well, in naval aircraft and so on and so forth. Next slide. So ocean acoustics is a core research area. Um, a lot of the work that we do today is dealing with very complicated in environments where sound propagation is uh, obviously very an important um, aspect of the way the, the fleet uh, operates. Um, there's an enormous in, uh, investment by the operational Navy to get that right. And more and more recently we've discovered or the Navy has discovered that it's the environment stupid. You really have to get this piece right because a lot of the sonars that we have, for example, both passive and active, are not functioning at the, uh, the optimum level, if you will, in terms of the precision with which they locate, track um, uh, threats, and so on and so forth. And that's because we had to refine, we know now that we have to refine uh, how we do ocean acoustics and in, improve the, uh, the accuracy uh, with which that's carried out. Uh, in order for us to get propagation physics correctly so that we can make our sonars work real well. And that uh, feeds the entire chain from, from the perspective of making contact with threats and ultimately dealing with them. Next slide. So inside the acoustics division itself, uh, the dominant uh, discipline is uh, physics. Most of us are physicists. There are a handful of other uh, disciplines, including we have one... Uh, uh, chemist in the acoustics division, but I would say ME is the second uh, most prominent discipline. Uh, most of us, not all of us, but most of us came to this, uh, came to acoustics with um, other disciplines, other focused disciplines. I myself was a laser physicist um, in, um, uh, from graduate school, but we're, we're now um, have about 60 people that are on the, uh, the technical side and, and uh, most of them are physicists, um, typically learning, not learning on the job uh, in the sense that nobody's ever seen the wave equation before, but um, physicists have a saying, a wave is a wave. And uh, ultimately being able to move into a new field is uh, relatively straightforward if you, uh, did a good job of getting your skills under your belt when you were training to be a physicist. Next slide. So this last slide just um, tries to emphasize what um, we work on, which is uh, improving the technology in what we call undersea warfare. Uh, the Navy is threatened by quiet a, a submarine designs coming from uh, Russia and other countries. A uh, lot. A lot is going on in terms of seabed warfare all the way down to full ocean depth. Um, unmanned underwater vehicles are uh, becoming much more sophisticated. They're becoming weaponized and they're really hard to detect and track because they're small. Even the large vehicles are much smaller than a submarine. Um, mine countermeasures, mine hunting, 
um, also a very, very important application uh, that uh, we're focused on. And the problem's just getting harder, but ocean acoustics um, is the central piece of it all and how we stitch together all of our solutions. And that's it for me, didn't have anything else to say. Awesome. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, I think we're going to move in now to the discussion period of the governmental pattern or panel. Sorry, uh, I think I I'll start that question off. Mike sort of um, touched on some of the current and future skills and needs that he feels uh, applies to NOAA and its different lines. Um, so the question I have for each of the panel members are: What are the current workforce needs? and those expected in the next 10 years. I'll, I'll Go ahead. Yeah, I think from my perspective, um, you know, on the research side, I think it's, it's what we're calling big data analytics. Um, we've collected a lot of data over the years and one of the mantras of NOAA is collect once, use many. So we've collected a lot of data and we try to then utilize those data for, for things that were collect that were um, other than the original purpose of the surveys. Um, and so we're trying, to, we're trying to do that. And in order to do that, you need to start looking into a lot of statistics and data statistics and, and analytical statistical treat, treatments of the data. And I think that's, that's kind of the big, the big growing part from the research aspect side of, of the agency. Um, the other need is really at the technical level. Um, I, I just see that we're just lacking in a lot of the technical level competence that we require because we do collect so much data at sea. We really do need competence at sea and for people to be able to make uh, decisions you know, all by themselves without having to email and rely on people on shore to, to answer the questions. So we really do need the at sea experience. and retaining that experience has is, is been extremely difficult on the NOAA side. Thank you. Jill or Brian? Yeah, this is Jill. I, I would agree with what, what Mike said. I mean, I think there's, um, particularly with a lot of the, just kind of acoustic monitoring data, just having um, an ability to um, to explore how to, to analyze, uh, you know, big data. I think we still have, um, a number of questions sort of on the uh, sound source to some extent, uh, different, you know, understanding, characterizing that more, but also there's always the ongoing questions uh, about impacts to, to different uh, groups of marine life. And what just started, of course, with marine mammals is um, applies now to turtles, fish, benthic animals. Um, so there's a lot of research questions and, and an ability to have, you know, uh, folks that are going to continue to be able to sort of explore those. I think I, working in the government sector, I think my one slide that sh sort of showed um, people's, uh, you know, degrees coming in kind of represents what I think are sort of our, our current as well as our expected future needs as far as qualifications from a, from a degree perspective. Um, yeah, but I, that, I think that's what I would add to it. So I'll bump it over to, I guess, Brian. Yeah, so the, the um, from our perspective, uh, just because uh, physicists tend to be uh, more flexible, um, oftentimes just a handful of physicists that really, you know, paid attention in school and did pretty well um, are the most flexible people we can throw at our problems. Um, we need numbers just because the uh, demand side from the Navy has gone up tremendously uh, with the, uh, the Cold War disappearing, a lot of the funding dried up in um, undersea warfare, ocean acoustics was de-emphasized largely and the Navy paid attention to other things. Today, uh, the Navy is screaming at us. You know, they want technology, they want discoveries, they want to make all their sonars work better, they want new sonars, to do handle some of the new problems. And um, we have a strong demand signal just um, because of the, you know, the, the degree of funding that's involved and the level of importance that the uh, folks in uniform and outside of uniforms are demanding um, 
uh, when you look at the future. Um, a lot of the leadership in the Navy now is, uh, is responding to this notion that we're going to be at war with the Chinese in the next couple of years. Ten years is, uh, is uh, way out there. And it's probably going to happen if it does happen inside the next few years. And they want technology. And so what we're doing, we find the most productive path for us is to, is to uh, not excluding other disciplines, but to get physicists um, in who have the mathematical physics training, obviously, generally speaking, um, uh, and uh, uh, the skill level to understand um, a lot of the, the physical uh, issues involved with uh, propagation and interaction with structures and so on and so forth. And um, um, there, um, there's a lot of demand, of course, for those kinds of skill sets from the general economy. Uh, and so um, um, our problem is numbers. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Carolyn, I saw your hand went up. Yeah, um, so I, um, as a fellow Fed, I guess I will ask this question. Um, I find when I'm hiring um, pretty difficult time uh, because of the limited applicant pool of US citizens. And this is obviously relevant to all of you. And of course you don't know the people who don't apply, but you must have some sense of whether that's a problem um, for you, because obviously you are kind of limited in needing to, to identify US citizens. So do you have any sense of whether that's changed, whether that's a problem? Um, I know if I wanna hire a non-US citizen, it's gotta be as a contractor. So that's a whole nother set of problems. It's much more expensive. I'm sure the Navy can't even do that. So could any of you speak to that issue a little bit? I, I think it's definitely a challenge because, you know, we know of, uh, particularly as we've moved into this more remote um, workforce or virtual workforce, um, that opens the door quite a bit, too, for uh, working with uh, folks. But I think it would require, as far as I, I understand, um, at least uh, coming from Bowman, it would require, you know, a change in policy at like OPM, Office of Personnel Management. Um, so. Um, yeah, that we're sort of in the same boat where we'd have to go through a contractor um, to achieve that. It's a problem for us as well. The, um, there's a desire because of COVID and, and all the, the obvious things that happen there is a desire for people to move um, to other locations around the country and just work from home. Our problem is we have so many things that are held close that... Um, you know, are at the secret and higher level, and it's hard to do any credible work with people, you know, 700 miles away. We've got to fly them in and things like that. And we're trying to discourage people from taking on this notion that perhaps they can live on the West Coast and, you know, have a job on the East Coast and so forth. So far, we're sort of at a standstill. We're, we don't have a stampede of people headed for the door We've lost, uh, I would say we've lost two or three percent in my division alone. Thank you. Well, from the NOAA perspective, um, I, 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 it really helps to have an idea of what the ultimate purpose of your data while you're working on the team. So I would say, if, you know, within the probably the navigational charting, that's probably more the physicist level kinds of or mathematical level. Um, but once you get into the fisheries and habitat, that, that's where you start integrating the biological information. And then you, it's, I found over the years, um, I'll just give you one example. I've been working with machine learning and I've gotten into it much, much more than I had intended because I had just had hoped I could pass my data over to a computer scientist and they would come back with the answer. Mm -hmm. And that's not it at all. Um, it, there is, I don't have a great understanding of machine learning and, and the computer scientists have even less of an understanding of fish, you know, or squid or whatever the natural resource is. And so we've been having an extremely difficult time, you know, getting that. So it's a lot of iterative processes. And so I think it depends on, you know, kind of the background of what you want the data to do. So if you're more, more in line of the physics side of things, and I think it's a more direct path to the end result of the data. If you're on the biological or oceanographic side, then it's, it's a much more difficult problem. 
Um, and, and, and same thing with, with, with uh, we have the same thing with US citizens also as, as, the, other, as the other panel members have too. So if I make a quick comment, the, so because of the uh, kinds of problems we were working on with regards to developing high performance classification tools for acoustic signals, ASW, mine countermeasures, and so on and so forth, particularly in high, highly cluttered environments, we moved to AI machine learning um, about 20 years ago uh, before it was fashionable. I'm sorry, I'm just, this is, this is just the truth. But um, we didn't have too many people who were trained in the art, but it's a mathematical physics problem. And the physicists, you know, people who were trained in high energy physics, et cetera, et cetera, I mean, they were all over the place in the acoustics division of all places. They took to that and were very, very productive in learning it and applying it. And today, a lot of the people that we have, we do have a few computer scientists who understand it and can apply it, but physicists are generalists, right? So if you work on a bio problem, um, their minds work in a way that allow them to, to learn a little bit of that real quickly and get the job done. Um, our, our problems are all focused pretty much on on machines that go under the water. But, you know, biology is, uh, is not our focus. Preston, you had your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, I wanted to follow up a little bit on Mike's comment about the kind of decision or the branch at which it was decided that some other people would build the sonars and the users would kind of separate from that. Um, there are parts of our kind of overall community where that doesn't occur, which is of course the Navy, the user and the developer tied together. And that's very useful. And that's where I come from, UT Austin Applied Research Lab. So we, we do train people that do that. So I guess my question is, how did that come to be? Could you comment a little bit more? Is it lack of people or lack of mission or what was it? That's a great question. And I, I've been trying to, I don't know the exact reason for that. I, it's probably lack of people. Um, you know, NOAA's mission is, is, again, it's more applied. So we're not in the basic research of, of developing electronics like that. Um, and I, you know, I, I've almost see it as the evolution from our, from, from, the, from an applied standpoint of I, almost the analogy of a CTD, you know, a CTD, at one point was the focus of the research and how you actually measured salinity using ele you know, electrical sensors and temperature and, and that. But now, I mean, it's ubiquitous. I, I, and I don't know exactly how a CTD works and yet I use those data. And we're, I think we're starting to see that a little bit in, a, in the echo sound or fisheries respect, perspective and that we use it as a tool more than the tool itself. Um, so, um, but I, but so the benefits are that we don't need to spend the money on the, on the R and D for that. We don't need that. We don't need to hire that expertise. We can hire other things. The limitation is that then you get what the manufacturer provides. And that is often, you know, and they're, they have certainly signed, they certainly want to serve the community, but they also have financial obligations to the company and they, they have to make be economically viable. So, um, you know, there's there's the trade-offs, and, and we do try to work very well. We and we actually do work very well with with industry. Um, so it's not it's not like there's a complete disjunct there, but but there is there are benefits and limitations to that. And I, and I don't know if it's just a, the evolution of using a technology or you know what. It certainly wasn't conscious, but it seems to be going on. But aren't there a lot more vendors around today? With the kind of equipment we need to do metrology and in water acoustics, yeah, it's got to be at least an order. <laughs> yeah, I know. I agree. I think that's true. I mean, as people use it more, there are more entities there to serve those folks and build these systems. So it may really not be needed. As long as there's a way to do some, you know, customization or things like that, um, I can see it working, you know in multiple ways, but my, my point is, you know, as Brian mentioned, you do need specific tools to solve specific problems and we don't know what the future problems will be. Hence, we, we can't build the tools today. Uh, we'll have to build them in the future. So who, who does that? Um, this We're getting pretty narrow at this point. So I'm gonna yeah, step let, back, gonna, thank uh, you. Jill's got her hand up and she wants to respond. So 
Uh, Will, I was going to shift to another um, sort of need, if that's okay. Uh -huh. or Yes, please. I, um, yeah, so I, I think uh, whether you know, you're so we're dealing with agencies that have different mandates here and, um, you know, national security and, uh, you know, energy development, all these sorts of things. Um, every one of us, though, is also regulated to some extent in um, and so the sorts of requirements that either we put on, um, it, it, you know, into our operators or are put on us are determined by people within the government, right? So there, I think, is a need for, um, on the regulatory side, on the policy side, for just a, a more connection and ability to understand the issues a bit more um, so that the requirements um, maybe become a little bit, um, I, I'm not saying they're not reasonable. A lot of them are, but there is a lot that are not. And you can you can kind of tie some of it directly to whether or not a particular agency has either any acoustics experience to help with that or enough. Uh, and that's often the challenge is that they may have it, um, but there's so much happening that they just don't have enough time to really look towards a solution. So one example, two would be monitoring. So I think there's a lot of room for us um, to really improve upon, um, we have, you know, you have research that gives you sort of the fundamental understanding, then you, you approve a project, and then you're supposed to monitor for impacts. And I'd say that's one area, particularly real-time monitoring, where we don't necessarily, we could really grow and have some, a better understanding of what are those real impacts so they can feed into future decisions. Um, and then understanding the more timeline, I feel like acoustics has a very important component in, in helping that, that space. Thank you. Um, Wu Zhang, you have your hand up. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to follow up on, uh, I think one of the, at least one of the panelists had uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the ret retention problems. And I'm just curious about sort of at which stage do you see it happen? Like, do people come into a job looking for another job? Or do people get trained on the job and then they jump for another job? And also, what do you see as the potential core problem of why there is a retention potential problem there? It, 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 oh, go ahead, Mike. It, okay, so I think from the, from the NOAA side, it's it's the latter. It's, it's They're coming in for a job and then they either get trained and move on, um, which happens a lot, or... <laughs> Um, but the, the career ladder is just extremely limited from, from where they started in the government. And that's, that can, that's a big issue sometimes in the government. Um, do you have some, you have freedom within a certain band, but to go above that, it's, you know, requires a lot more, uh, either more degrees and which, you know, costs more. So you need the budget. And so there's, it's a, you know, it's a vicious cycle at that point. Um, and the retention problem, I think, is really just, um, how to keep people interested because there are, you know, there are people that really enjoy it and, and like to do it. Um, but others, it's their job and they, they, they enjoy the job. They do it well, but it's not their life. And so um, I think we need to be able to keep those career tracks, those, the, that, that mindset in terms of, of what people need in mind when we have, when we create these jobs and, and create the careers for the people also. And one thing I would note uh, related to this, and this is this just happened for us because we're a small bureau, um, we have to require people to sort of be a little more interdisciplinary. So they may come in with a really strong background in one area, but we're going to train them up. So our our uh, physical scientists are learning biology, and our biologists are getting into the physical side of things, and everybody's intermixing in the policy. And what that does, though, is give you like a much a much larger area of learning and so i think people tire of the position a lot further down the road because you're constantly learning i mean i was at an age at a large agency i was at noaa and in a large agency you are sort of stove piped a little bit more and so i felt like i had gotten to my my i didn't maximize my learning but i got up that curve pretty quickly where if you start offering these maybe as more inter interdisciplinary positions so people are working across different you know sub disciplines in this area i think that does entice people because it's constantly um, leaning into their their need to learn Awesome, thank you. I, I'm glad you brought up interdisciplinary because that's sort of been going on. Mike said that biologists 
sometimes don't have that physical or quantitative background and vice versa. So that's something I want to explore further before we end, but Gail had her hand up before. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to our speakers for, um, for your insights. It's very helpful. So, um, I'm, uh, what I'm hearing from you guys is that there are some key needs, um, certainly for folks that can handle big data, also for technical level, um, people that are trained at the technical level, and then also um, a need for flexible physicists, um, as Brian described them. And so I'm wondering if there are go-to institutions where you're recruiting, or if you're not actively recruiting, um, if you have a sense for where your works workforce um, comes from. It, it, are you seeing some bright spots? Well, we have two of our individuals that came out of Jennifer. <laughs> so she, she really trains up good uh, graduate students. Um, and then we are, we've, they, we've, we pulled some out of uh, contractors, um, model like JASCO and, and uh, Green Ridge. So that's where ours have shown up from. Thank you. Yeah, we've, uh, University of Washington, is one place that, that has um, some formal training uh, in, in the fisheries acoustic sides of things and, and also at the APL. So we've picked up students from there. Um, UNH, you know, is, is a very good program with Jennifer and CECOM and, and that, that, that center is also on, on the East Coast. It's been very successful for us. So we've, uh, Brian, Brian Houston here. So the, we've made a, so over the course of my career, um, we've made a concerted effort to establish relationships with universities and the specific departments that uh, generate the kinds of people that we think we uh, can use. Uh, and sometimes you can't develop that relationship because you don't have common research areas, but we've been successful in getting students from some of the local universities in, um, in the Washington area, but also across the country as well. You just have to put the energy into, you know, engaging these places, developing relationships, and then, you know, postdocs, uh, hire postdocs out of those organizations and so on and so forth. And it's, it's a little bit of a hit and miss process, but if you invest in it, it usually works. So. All right. We're coming to the end here, and I just wanted to um, end on one thought process that, that Jill brought up with interdisciplinarity. Acoustics is highly, there's so many facets of acoustics and so many needs that go into that. So one of the things that I think Mike brought up was the versatility of people that have a very interdisciplinary background, that may not have the quantitative assets, or are, is it more attractive to hire somebody that has a very sort of stovepipe tr traditional degree and is very quantitative? I think, I know what I think, um, but I, I will ask you guys from your organizations, what is more attractive to you when you are looking to hire people? The interdisciplinary breadth that they have or their quantitative skills? We we do a first brush to say, do they have the technical capability, right? And, and whatever it might be, but we know to complete our picture, which is partially complete with our center, but you know, it could be a greater, you know, we want people to have fundamentally like sort of a home discipline, you know, that's mm -hmm. the, but then as we go through the hiring process, we look for those people who are flexible wanting to learn, willing to sort of engage and, and go into, into being, becoming more interdisciplinary. If they have it coming in, great, but we're gonna build it once it's in. But you can tell often in a hiring where there's somebody who really just wants to stay in their lane versus somebody who's willing to sort of expand and we only look for those people that are willing to expand. Okay. Brian, you look like you were ready to jump in. <laughs> no, I was just, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but we've been much more successful with non-acoustic majors. We, we have a couple of them, there's no question, but a lot of our stars 
in the division. And these are people that started here before I did. So it's, it's not me. I'm just, and it's, you know, it's not my bias. A lot of people contributed significantly to our problems here at NRL and uh, in the operational Navy who were never trained in acoustics to begin with. Keep an open mind, I guess. Mike? Yeah, I was going to just echo what Jill had said. I think, you know, we need people that have have quantitative abilities. Um, you know, we've, and it's, you, it, it can be hard, it can be a little difficult to figure that out, but, um, but they do need to be, you need to, they need to be flexible again because of the, the, the needs of what our mandates and what we need from people. So I think our first thing is to have someone with quantitative skills. So you can take a biologist. Um, and in fact, I've actually had a little bit better luck teaching biologists sometimes the quantitative skills than trying to get a computer scientist to focus on fish, you know, or, or something biological. Because they just, they, they, you know, it, people go into different disciplines for, for different reasons, but the keeping an open mind, exactly as Brian said, is, is really important. But trying to get someone with, quant with at least quantitative skills, reg regardless if they're biologists, ecologists, uh, physicists, or whatever, they need to have those quantitative skills. And then then you can bring them up and, and you know to do the job that you need them to do. Thank you. Your all your answers sort of reinforce my thought that it's context dependent. Mm -hmm. Quantitative skills are important. I tell all of my students that you shouldn't be afraid of math. And so that has to start early on. Okay, well, we are at our time. I want to thank the three federal organization panelists. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. I hope you stick around and, and listen to um, our industry panel that's coming up next. And so um, I, everybody's giving virtual applause. You've got my virtual applause and a, a heartfelt thank you for spending the time with us. We are gonna shift now to our industry panel. And I'm gonna do the same thing and ask each person to, um, how many do we have? One, two, three, four, five. Keep it to three minutes if you can, the intro of you and your organization so that we have enough time to discuss in depth. I'm gonna call on Bruce Martin first. Thanks, Jen. Um, can you see my, my screen now, everyone? Yes. Great. So yeah, I'm Bruce Martin. I'm from Jasco Applied Sciences here in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, I'm representing Jasco for this since our, our US lead is on vacation this week. Um, so I wanna to talk to you about our workforce. Um, so, Worldwide, we have 120 people within JASCO, all focused on acoustics. Um, 60 of them are acoustic scientists or managing acoustic scientists. Then we have nine software people, nine mechanical, electrical, or systems engineers, um, nine techs that support the engineers. We have 15 naval architects who are in a company called uh, DW Ship Consult in Germany. And then we have 18 support staff uh, to help with all the things that have to be done. For today's discussion, um, I am focusing on the acoustics team in particular, uh, but as everybody's been saying in the government side, you need the support staff. So you can see we have you know, 27 listed here, um, software and engineering staff that help make our equipment and help make the processing that the um, acoustics teams need. So I, I sort of scraped through our, our resumes to come up with these numbers here. Um, of the 60 people we have, there are um, five categories I put them in from junior biologist, junior scientist, management, senior biologist, and senior scientist. And you can see the numbers across the top. Um, we have more juniors than we do seniors with management in the middle, which makes a fair amount of sense. And you can see that there's more and more PhDs as you go up in seniority, which also makes a fair amount of sense. Of our 60 staff that I've called the acoustics realm, 28 are PhDs, which kind of surprised me when I saw that. Um, on the right-hand side here, we're looking at what are they doing? <clears throat> um, the junior biologists, there's definitely a tilt towards the marine biology side and, and data analysis, whether it's um, field work as a biologist or uh, sitting in at the desk and drawing boxes around marine mammal calls, which is the marine, the manual analysis. The scientists are focused on data analysis and uh, propagation modeling. So the, the quantitative skill side is what we have there. And, and a few people are focused on animat propagation modeling, animat model. The senior biologists, um, some are manual analysis and its interpretation. Some are more focused on taking that data um, and actually looking at what it means. Like 
what are where are animals actually living and what what are the implications of that? And we have two people who are are uh, experts in the effects of noise and have been in that field for a long time. And then in our senior scientist side, uh, it's primarily propagation modeling with a few that are focused on data analysis or effects of noise and animat modeling. Um, where where do we get them from? So this left hand side here, it's you know, where they went to school. Um, as the colors and where they're working now, uh, you'll see that there's a, definitely a trend towards working in the country where you're educated. Um, on the U.S. side in particular, uh, we have 16 people working in the U.S., of which 14 were educated in the U.S., uh, one who came in from the Ukraine and one who came in from Australia. Um, in Canada, we see that we are getting a lot of people from Canada as well, um, and, but we are taking people in from the U.S. Um, and from the U.K. especially. So what are the fields? Very similar to what the, the government side were saying, it's people are coming in from all over the place and, and winding up in these acoustic disciplines. We do have 15 people that were in acoustics to begin with, whether it was acoustical oceanography, physical acoustics, um, or uh, a related field. Um, marine biology and biological oceanography has a, another large contingent. And then there's a, a scattershot across a whole bunch of other fields um, with physicists and oceanographers being the, probably the largest separate group, but we have a medical scientist, we have a couple of neuroscientists, um, uh, geophysics, mathematics, uh, computer science. We, we have a few of those. Um, one that we definitely want to hold on to who is in machine learning and who was going to go to Google, but he found out that what we do is more interesting. So he's, he's uh, signed on to work for us when he's finished in a couple of weeks. Um, I thought I'd take a shot at just looking at what we have for diversity, at least in the sense of gender, um, and was reasonably happy with you know, what we found. Uh, when it comes to degrees, it's uh, the senior degrees, it's pretty close to an even split. Um, and when it comes to the, the genders and the, the roles, um, we probably could do better on the management side, having more females involved. But other than that, I think we're in, we're in reasonably good shape uh, trying to get, keep good diversity. And that's nothing we've done in particular. That's just who's in the field and, and who we've been able to recruit. Um, what do we need? Bruce, uh, Bruce we're going to have to move okay. on so everybody can have a chance. Yep. Um, can we just leave that up to read for a minute yep. and then I'll move on? Awesome. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you. All of these slides will be saved and they will be made to the public as part of the National Academy's process and it, they will be made to each, made available to each one of the panel members also. Thank you so much for the, those breakdowns and those stats. I know that took time to do and I very much appreciate it. I found it fascinating. Um, our next person, Dave Bradley. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yep. Go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> I'm probably in the wrong session. Uh, look at the alphabet soup. Uh, it, it's, we actually work out of the offices of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy, Installations, and Environment. You see the SERDP and ESTCP uh, definitions. Next. We're, uh, I'm in the second row uh, right-hand box. Uh, we're a hundred plus million dollar organization and there, there's exactly the number of people that you see uh, representing the office. Uh, we. Our support is uh, contractual. Next. Uh, for those that might not know, um, the, the program uh, based upon either SERDP or ASTCP follows what you find in the Department of Defense uh, part of the organization. Uh, that is the SERDP is, is the 6-1, to 6-3 end of things, and ESTCP is uh, uh, the higher category funding. Uh, a difference that we represent in the office is what I would call accelerated uh, RDT&E, that is to move from uh, SERDP to ESTCP uh, doesn't occur over decades, it occurs over years. Uh, the support uh, people that are part of my technical committee uh, 
represent the receivers of, of the technologies and science that uh, we introduce. Uh, next. Uh, this gives you a quick picture of what we're trying to do. Uh, what is our job in general? The general job is cleanup. Uh, you're looking at the mess uh, that the Defense Department has created over the years uh, that are in various, uh, in, in this case, marine-based locations, ranging from the from the your left, uh, which is a 155 or basically a six-inch uh, artillery round, down to grenade-sized things. So as opposed to ASW, uh, our targets are quite small. Uh, the other aspect of it is uh, that uh, they, they can be extremely dangerous and, and the cleanup is, is oriented toward that. Next. Uh, this is the focus of the program. Find, identify, and localize uh, the munition. Uh, in many cases, it's been found that the cost is too much, so we manage in place. And after you found it and identified it, uh, you have to figure out some way to dispose of it. Not necessarily on site, despite what that slide says. Okay, skip the next two and go to the last one. If okay, good. This is actually from your uh, charge. Uh, and I put it up for a very particular reason. Uh, from the viewpoint of trying to answer some of your questions, uh, one of the major things that, that I feel need, this is my soapbox, so please bear with me. Uh, one of the major things that needs to be understood is that, is that acoustics in general, and especially underwater acoustics, is a science in its own right. And it needs to be recognized as that. People need to be trained uh, to move into that field, as Brian and, and Mike and a number of people have already told you. Uh, there's, you know, most of the people that are in it today came from some other profession, quite frankly, and they more or less kind of fumbled their way into it. So to me, the major soapbox thing that I believe needs to be addressed is just the recognition that the various subdisciplines of ocean acoustics uh, together have to be represented as a card carrying science. Over. Thank you very much, Dave. Couldn't have said that better myself there. That last slide, I like it. Um, next person is Awen Sarma. Mm -hmm. Is Alwyn here? Yes. Uh, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's Ashwin, by the way. Thank Ashwin, you. thank you yeah. very much. I'm sorry I mispronounced. Uh, that's okay. Um, so, yeah, my name is Ashwin Sarma. I work for, at BA Systems. Uh, a little bit about me, just um, real quickly. Uh, my, I've been basically a DOD employee for the last uh, 20, 22 years at Newark. I'm a statistical signal processor, um, and um, I also um, work um, as a professor at URI. I teach graduate uh, signal processing. Um, so that's my background. Uh, right now, I've been at BAE for the last six years and enjoying it. I also am the chair of the IEEE UASP workshop, which is the Underwater Acoustic Signal Processing Workshop, started in Rhode Island by um, Don Tufts and others. Uh, and the Providence Signal Processing Chair of IEEE. Um, so um, I'm a big Celtics fan, go Celtics tonight. Uh, my next slide, please. So my work can be in uh, uh, many areas uh, and in our group here, our work is in uh, a large uh, set of areas. We work on uh, building active sources uh, where uh, we do supply the Navy and others, uh, other small businesses with those. We also do a great deal of signal processing uh, and uh, development of um, ocean um, sensing and, and uh, underwater um, warfare kind of uh, systems that, uh, that we all have a uh, you know, good deal of expertise on that uh, we've built on, up over time. 
Um, the slide kind of shows what uh, some of the other um, speakers have been talking about. Uh, ocean acoustics is is a field that uh, permeates a lot of what we do, but it isn't the field, so to speak, of in and of itself, as Dave was saying. And it can be, but it um, it is a multidisciplinary um, set of set of skills that we would need to to uh, to thrive at a place like BAE um, or any of these other places. So double E physics, oceanography, statistics, math, biology in, in uh, cases, mechanical engineering is, is is also very useful. So and of course life experience. You do need a lot of a, a lot of these things, and you need to be invested in this for a good deal of time to uh, develop enough skills that you you actually come up with something useful and new. Um, so next slide, please. So as far as uh, training the future workforce based on the prompts that uh, we have in, in this session, obtaining and training the workforce and what we need more of, what do I do? I organize conferences and invite uh, you know, up and coming researchers along with well-established uh, people in my field, um, uh, some of which are on your panel here, like uh, Art Bagger and I uh, work at this UASP conference together. Uh, we I uh, read and review a lot of papers and use the network to learn of candidates that could work um, suitably here. Um, teaching graduate classes in uh, electrical engineering, signal processing, uh, especially information theory, comms, tracking, and um, pattern recognition, machine learning, allows me to um, find out who's interested in this kind of work. Because as you've probably seen in um, in the previous speakers, there has to be a level of interest that uh, may or may not um, translate into uh, um, a longstanding career in it. You have to almost generate that yourself, that level of interest. Um, so IDing those kinds of people uh, is, is something you can do when you teach. Um, I serve on local government, uh, academia, and industry committees to identify such people as well. Uh, the NIUVT in uh, Rhode Island and Connecticut is something that uh, is a good uh, vehicle for that. So what we need more of uh, as far as BAE is we kind of need more of uh, different types of engineers and scientists. Um, you know, my background is physics and double E. Um, we need more specialists. We need more at sea engineers. We need more system level engineers and multidisciplinarians, as you've heard. A uh, suggestion that I would have is early on in um, the, the curricula of, of many of these majors, we need to potentially um, offer more cross-listed courses and develop more cross-listed courses. Uh, people who are interested in, in mathematics, statistics, um, physics, and electrical engineering, there's a lot of overlap there in, in those majors. Um, and acoustic uh, propagation, for example, is something that c can come from the physics side of it, can come from uh, the um, also the math side of it and the computer science side of it. So there's a lot of overlap there. Uh, it, it may be something that I think that uh, based on my teaching, a lot of students would find interesting to take a class like that, especially if there was uh, a future in that, that they, they could find themselves in a place like BAE or someplace else where they could use this um, the course uh, material that they would have gotten from such a, a interdisciplinary course. I, uh, I know we're for, gonna have to, We're going to have to move on. Um, sure. Can you please wrap up your last two points quickly so we can move on to the next? Sure, yeah. And uh, I think what we also need more of is better elevator speech development. Uh, for example, include perhaps pass-fail teaching components in various courses. And uh, finally, physical oceanography. Um, ramp up the rigor here because when we get new uh, employees, sometimes even if they have a physical oceanography graduate degree, they don't have uh, the, uh, the skills to be able to implement those um, acoustic propagation quickly. And um, that's much. all I got. Thank you. We're going to move right on to Scott Loringer from Kongsberg.
Oh, sorry about that. Um, so I did not prepare any slides, but I do have some remarks that I can read instead. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so thanks uh, for putting this together, Jennifer and Caroline and the rest of the committee. I uh, appreciate getting the chance to talk to all of you. Um, my name is Scott Loringer. I'm the sales manager for Ocean Science at Kongsberg Discovery, which is a division of Kongsberg that manufactures sensors and robotics. Um, and I'll quickly run through my background just so you guys know who I am, and then I'll talk about what I think are sort of the three focus areas for ocean acoustics expertise, uh, especially in the research and uh, industry sector. So I began my career as an undergraduate studying biology at Cornell, um, just like a few other folks have been biologists and then jumped into um, acoustics. Um, I had the, the pleasure of graduating during the financial crisis and recession in the early 2000s and quickly discovered the difficulty of finding work in a contracting economy. So I decided I need a skill that would set me apart from other marine scientists. And that led me to studying underwater acoustics at the University of New Hampshire. Um, and for my PhD, I studied the physics of how sound interacts with oil in the marine environment. And then after the PhD, I entered the job market again uh, with during an economic downturn. Uh, but this time, with an acoustics background, I found a very different job market than the one I had found after an undergrad. Um, my education on acoustics meant that I was uh, highly in demand, and I had a choice between several postdoc positions. I ended up taking a postdoc position with the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute. Uh, as well as with Dalhousie University and Woods Hole Oceanographic, uh, where I studied acoustic instruments for monitoring seafloor carbon sequestration um, and acoustic scattering from physical oceanography and biology. And then after my postdocs, once again, I found myself in a job market with a lot of opportunities as an ac acoustician. Um, I had opportunities from federal labs, renewable energy companies, academic institutions, uh, and instrument and platform manufacturers. Ultimately, I ended up taking a position with what is now Kongsberg Discovery, uh, where I work with the science community providing the proper equipment and expertise for acoustic investigation of the ocean. Um, I took this position with the goal of providing support to end users of acoustic instrumentation and of expanding the use of acoustic methods in marine science. Um, and as a side note, Kongsberg believes that there is a sufficient evidence for an increase in the demand for marine sensors and robotics that they've just established Kongsberg Discovery, which is a separate, separate business area within Kongsberg that's focused on sensors and robotics, uh, where it used to be part of Kongsberg Maritime. It's now its own group. All right, so um, acoustic uh, education is something of, that I'm pretty passionate about, and I, I believe the main needs for ocean acoustics expertise can be broken down into, two, into three main foci. Uh, so we need acousticians who study the physics of sound and how it interacts with the world. We need uh, acoustics end users with sufficient knowledge to apply acoustic methods. And we need educated technical experts who can design, construct, troubleshoot, and repair acoustic instrumentation. So that essentially uh, breaks things up into the instrument itself, the forward problem, how acoustics interacts with the world, and the inverse problem, where you're using acoustics to understand the world. Um, and the demand for these positions, I think, is likely to increase, to see a significant uptick driven in part by increases in things like more infrastructure in the ocean. So the development of offshore wind and tidal turbines will require an influx of acquisitions to design the infrastructure, to understand the environmental impact of the infrastructure, and to develop solutions for mitigating those impacts. Um, there's also an increasing demand for acquisitions in the defense sector, not just for um, unexploded ordinances and submarine hunting, but also around things like surveillance of critical infrastructure which pulls you back into offshore wind, um, as well as pipelines and communication infrastructure. In other sectors, such as fisheries and environmental research, there's uh, increased demand for enhanced signal processing and data analysis skills. Broadband acoustics has moved from laboratory developed instruments, as we've talked about a little bit before, uh, to off-the-shelf products. And so broadband acoustics, uh, it's sort of like going from black and white to color. There's a significantly more information that can be gleaned from broadband than narrowband data. However, wide adoption of the broadband analysis requires a community that is comfortable thinking in the frequency domain and switching between time and frequency with knowledge of the potential pitfalls in 4A analysis. And so to develop this community, I think we need more programs in academia that focus on acoustics, not just as a course in the mechanical engineering department, but thoroughly developed multi-course instruction on understanding acoustics and 4A analysis. And that will help, I think, to develop more of the acousticians who study the forward problem. 
Um, but the, the burden isn't just on academia. I think it would be great to also see immersive short courses in broadband acoustics uh, as like a um, combination between academia and industry. Um, and hopefully this could work to develop those end users who are sufficiently proficient to use acoustics, but that's not what they're studying. They're studying the inverse problem. Um, these kind of courses exist for multi-beam sonars, modeling, remote sensing, stable isotopes, and all kinds of different topics. Um, I'd also like to encourage industry to develop tutorial materials for their instruments that includes data processing. So um, I focus a lot on these remarks, um, on, but I need to, I want to emphasize that data analysis tools are critical to uh, adoption of acoustics in the marine community and to developing more acquisitions. Um, and I'd also like to emphasize that all this work in the development of ocean acoustics should be done in concert with increasing the community's familiarity and understanding and comfort with auto automation and autonomy. So these instruments, like we've said, are part of the solution to understanding the ocean. I think we're going to see them more and more integrated into uncrewed platforms and also as a tool for things like adaptive sampling, where they're integrated with other instrumentation and they're just one tool in the suite of technology. Um, I think that's about all the time. So, uh, so I'll just say thank you and um, looking forward to talking some more. Thanks, Scott. Um, our last intro is going to come from Brandy Murphy. Hello, let me just share the screen really quick. I'm already jumping ahead because for time. Uh, can you see that? <clears throat> yes. Okay. So uh, I'm here on behalf of the U.S. Academic Research Fleet uh, and the University National Oceanographic Laboratory System. Um, the University National Oceanographic Laboratory System, UNALS, is uh, a group of um, PIs, funding agencies, and ship operators whose goal is to provide platforms for world-class oceanographic research. And thankfully, every one of you has touched on all the different ways that acoustics are involved. Uh, when I first was asked about this, I was like, I really need you to narrow it down because literally every system on board the vessel has acoustics involved. Um, so I'm gonna jump ahead into what, who we hire and why and what they do with acoustics. So this slide is meant to convey the wide variety of tasks that we're asking our technicians to do. There's been an explosion of um, technology that is ex expected to be on board these platforms to provide research, which includes network uh, satellite comms, um, overboarding CTDs have been mentioned as the backbone of science in the past, but at this point I almost think it is some form of acoustics biology and nets, operating cranes, acoustic releases, multi-beam uh, mapping, GPS, uh, MET sensors. The things that we're asking of our technicians are so widely varied that it's getting to the point that specialists in any topic are almost, almost worthless on board the vessels. Um, here is the same information uh, but you know, in tech um, and what I or in text and what I couldn't get in there in those images is wire lubrication and termination, personal safety, computer programming, hazmat safety. Um, these are all things that we are asking of one or two people on board every research cruise to be responsible for. Um, and then here's just some of the common uh, acoustic systems that we have on board: multi-beam echo sounders, often Kongsberg sub-bottom profilers, biological sounders, current Doppler profilers, ultra short ultra short baseline positioning systems, releases, portable 2D and 3D seismic. Now we have all those things on board. Why don't we have more um, specific? Um, skill sets when it comes to acoustics. And part of that comes to bunk space. Every expert that we put on a boat for technology, for supporting the tech is a scientist that cannot go to sea. Um, there's also the frequency and need of use. These vessels are general use platforms. Not everybody who goes out is going to be multi-beam mapping. Not everybody who goes out is gonna be doing a CTD. And so do I need a full-time employee that is an expert in multi-beams? Or do I need somebody that can do a wide range of smaller tasks? Um, there's also um, quality um, assurance and QC. So we have the stuff on board. Does it work is one thing that we can do. Uh, lights are green. Can we troubleshoot why lights aren't green? Yes. Um, so we know it's outputting data. 
do we know if that data is any good? Well, that takes time and processing away from launching a CTD. And so some of those things are being moved onshore. Um, and then the other issue is in the US academic research fleet, every operator is a different uh, employer, every single one of them. So every academic hiring issue that you have ever had, we have in the US academic research fleet <laughs> when it comes to hiring. So one of the things that we have done um, and I have heard mention of CECOM and uh, UNH is we've developed facilities that are specialized in some of these systems that are not on board the ship, but they can remote support us. And they help with things like installing equipment, patch testing and calibrating, troubleshooting, quality assurance. Um, R2R also collects data and makes sure that it's got some amount of um, you know, value to it. And then planning and logistics for how we do a good survey um, for a particular scientist for a particular project when not everyone on board is a multi-beam or current expert. So that's the end of my slideshow and it is a unique problem than um, what some of you have. We have similar issues with retention and recruitment and things that we're noticing um, is, um, I heard someone mention dead-end jobs. Um, we are requiring people to work in cities that host world-class oceanographic institutions, but we're not paying them as if they are, uh, as if they can live there. So we need them to be on site, but we're not paying them enough to uh, do that. And so there's a drive for people to do it remotely. Thanks to improved internet access, there is some help with that. Um, academic hiring practices are a problem. We've heard of um, salary inversion, where the longer you've been at an institution, the less you make relative to new people who come in, because the hiring practices don't actually increase pay the longer you've been there. So the only way to get what you're worth is to leave an institution and go to another institution. Thankfully, we're made up of lots of institutions, so technicians go from one to another, and that, that's how they're but that is a recruitment and retention problem. And also uh, dead end jobs, some of the things that you could potentially move into have arbitrary requirements like, oh, you have to have a master's degree. You have 15 years of troubleshooting shipboard electronics, but in order to move into a manager position, I need you to have a master's degree. And that means that there's nowhere for them to go. Um, so yeah, that's about what I got. Anything else I can answer in questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. This was really great to hear from five different people, five different backgrounds and five different needs. Um, I'm going to go to the panel to see um, the Academy's panel or committee to see to questions to start us off with. Um, yeah. yeah, I can start us. Um, so thank you for all that information. That was very helpful. Um, could you tell us a little bit more on where exactly your company or agency is primarily hiring from? So this might be institutions or if they're coming from um, other companies or, or where you're seeing your new hires coming from. Do you want to start with someone in particular or is that for all of us? For all. So whoever wants to jump in. Uh for JASCO, it's um, a lot of people coming out of University of Victoria and Dalhousie. Those are our two big oceanographic universities for sure. Um, we've seen lots of people coming out of Portland State. We've got several people from Portland State uh, out of the US. Um, Southampton in the UK is a big one. Curtin in, the U in Australia is another one. I think oh. the BAE depends um, if, uh, if you're at a you're a senior employee, you're really probably coming from other institutions uh, and you've, you've been in the field for a while. If you're a junior employee, UNH, uh, University of Rhode Island, University of Massachusetts, um, and um, any of the other uh, private schools, uh, we have a lot of um, MIT, Cornell uh, grads as well, um, WPI, RPI. Um, the U.S. Academic Research Fleet gets them from a wide variety of places. A lot of times we're hiring um, recent um, STEM undergrads of any kind. Honestly, the best skill for being a marine technician in, in the Academic Research Fleet is to have self-taught yourself anything technical. And if I can see someone has done that, then I'm like, oh, you're a good fit. You will learn on the job and do it yourself. 
Um, the other thing is we have a program called the MATE Internship Program, where we take um, folks from community colleges and undergraduates and landlocked places to introduce them to the Marine Tech role as an intern temporarily on a vessel. Um, and we it's been so successful that a lot of our hires are coming directly out of that. We, um, myself and several of the other people who recently started at Kongsberg are coming from UNH CECOM. Um, they're slowly infiltrating all of Kongsberg. Um, <laughs> we also hire from within industry. We've picked up some people from Sail Drone. Um, and a lot of those people that we even hire from within the industry uh, come from NOAA, where they come from the research fleet. Um, and we also uh, get a lot of engineers coming out of the Navy. We contract with uh, uh, probably in equal portions, uh, government laboratories, uh, pr small private companies and academia. Little bit of an emphasis on the academic uh, source of, of folks. Thank you. Was that everybody? I think everybody got to, on the panel got to answer. And um, Lisa, committee member, go ahead, you have a question. Thank you all again for your presentations today. It's super helpful information. Um, we heard multiple times. I didn't have a background in this and I learned it once I got on the job. <laughs> so I would like to dig into that a little bit more and try to understand if there are formal on the job training opportunities. Is it going to the bookstore buying acoustics for dummies or <laughs> is there um, other opportunities that you have that you use each either like professional societies or some sort of like in-house academies, or is it all just learn on the job ad hockey approach? Um, for Jasco, we have a fairly formalized training plan for uh, field work. That one, especially we need people to go through and, and do the videos, do the hands-on training, and then go through multiple layers of doing field work and being accredited for the field work. That one is very formalized. Modeling um, is semi-formalized. There's, again, training materials, exercises you go through, and then you mentor with a senior modeler. Um, same thing for the marine biologists who are doing analysis. They, they will mentor uh, with a senior biologist, pass the tests effectively, and then get reviewed and feedback between themselves. Uh, for the data and analysts, we have a tool set, and then same thing, you, you work hands-on with the tool set. Um, and, and advance through that. For um, a lot of the incoming engineers we have, it's not a formalized, but if there is a mentorship program where you'll have someone senior who walks you through for the first year or two. Um, my on-the-job training in acoustics was in academia. Um, and I, I had no background, but I just sort of got handed a textbook and um, a lot of really good conversations from my advisor who is on this call right now. So I'll only say nice things about him. Um, but uh, the on-job training that we get, it tends to be, the problem with on-job training, in my opinion, is that it is great to find out exactly what you need to do. It is very difficult to find out what you don't know from on-the-job training until suddenly you have a problem in front of you and you don't have the information you need which is why I think things like short courses and things like some sort of formalized training for people who don't want to necessarily be acousticians, but want to understand the processes that helps to fill in some of those gaps you may not know you have until you really need that information. And, sorry, could I just jump in and layer on a question? I heard a couple of times of, um, we have programs. Are your, do your mentors have to go through any sort of specialized training to earn that title of mentor? No. Yeah, our field leads have to, they, they have to be a field lead and then they can graduate to be a field trainer. We, we only have two or three of those. In the U.S. academic research fleet, um, you kind of have to hit the ground running. And so usually most of our vessels sail with two technicians for each cruise. And so new technicians will often be the second technician. Um, and it could be for even more than a year because um, you don't, see everything that we do uh, in the course of a year but there is no formal like oh yeah it's just well I've been here 10 minutes longer than you so I'm going to be the one to show you the ropes. <laughs> I would say in uh, in our field I'm in SAS labs which is a 
the R and D uh, wing of BAE, and uh, I think it's pretty difficult to uh, to do mentoring. You have to um, have the opportunity to um, the student has to have the opportunity and the interest to most likely be working outside of the job, either on a degree or or something they're interested in. Those are the cases that uh, are the best in terms of uh, getting a, getting an output, uh, a good mentoring output when they're working with uh, with other students, uh, other um, other mentors, older mentors. I know, for example, that's kind of how it worked for me. Um, we do have official mentoring um, programs, and um, and usually we are paired up with somebody who's interested in getting an advanced degree. I also want to add a layer of complexity for the academic research fleet, which is almost all of the technical services uh, is funded with grants. And when it comes to funding with grants, we've all used grants before. We're using every penny of that to get as much research as we can. And sometimes that comes at the cost of training or development. Um, and so that's another issue that we have. And one of the reasons that we don't have a more robust training program for marine technicians. I think part of the answer to the original question is, is uh, I would use the term happenstance, quite frankly. Uh, it's a mixture of somebody who can mentor together with somebody who develops an interest. They may not have begun working on their degree with a particular goal in mind, but it's it's more they begin, they meaning the, the, the junior person uh, begins working in an area, gets attracted into it in a more robust way because of just personal interest. And, and that to me is happenstance. Uh, very, I, I, it's hard to imagine how many people sitting on this call actually at age 16 had any idea what they would be doing at this point in time with their life. Over. That's a good point. That's a very good point. Um, people, people happen into this a little late. How do we do a better job of, of making these real job and career opportunities visible earlier on? That's a good point. Uh, Carolyn, you have your hand raised. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering for the panel, you know, we always hear anecdotal sort of anecdotal mutterings that, oh, things have gotten so much worse in terms of hiring in a certain field, et cetera. I guess I'd like to know a little bit about your anecdotal on the ground experience. Are you seeing more applicants, fewer applicants? Do they have the expertise that you're looking for? Or are you like the government people we spoke to earlier, identifying certain characteristics, flexibility, quantitative ability, and then hoping that you can bring them in? So I know it's anecdotal, but whatever you can say to that. Uh, yeah, I can I can jump in here. Uh, one of the things that I've seen um, is the rate of change in our industry means that the hiring practices and requirements are not keeping up. So what we actually need out of our new hires are based on old job descriptions. Um, and it, we cannot go to sea anymore without having some experience in satellite communications and IT. It's not only science that needs that anymore, but if the ship can't call a doctor, we don't get to go to sea. So, and, and that was never something that was a part of the original intention of the marine technicians. And so um, I find that we're, we're hiring based on past experience instead of looking um, for future for for future needs. We were finding that the, the hardest people to get are the software folks. They're the ones that are really hard to get your hands on. Um, for the marine biologists, we generally kind of, we either can hire good people from Dalhousie or UVic, or we, we have been involved with them as students through honors or masters. So we know what we're getting. Um, electrical and mechanical engineers, same thing. We work with the university. So we often will hire the people that we have already worked with that, that had uh, summer positions with us. Just uh, in the US, there's been a lot of hiring lately uh, to support East Coast Wind. And um, there they've had a pretty good success working with students and, you know, doing the interviews, finding people who have the right, uh, um, you know, mindsets and been well-trained. 
Quick question and follow up. You said software folks. Is that software related to signal processing and analysis or software related to um, GUI development and um, non expert user software? It's more the, uh, the embedded signal processing kind of software. Um, yeah, but also some of the, like we have some web service stuff, but finding people for that is also challenging. Um, the, the data analysis, getting a report written kind of software, that's mostly done by people who've come out of an academic program where data analytics was something they had to do anyway. So, but it's, it's not the professional software that, that's needed. It's the professional ones that are hard to find. Thank you. We're uh, just wrap it up. Uh, we're, we're having a tough time finding field technicians, people who will be in traveling 60% of the time, jumping boat to boat um, with uh, the knowledge we need to be able to troubleshoot these things, to show up at the UNOLS fleet and troubleshoot a multi-beam. That seems to be a, the field technician at CE expertise seems to be a, a theme that we've heard across both panels, both industries, all of the industries. Um, that, that is a huge take home message for this committee. Um, yeah, one of the issues is a lot of the field technicians are often paid at much lower compensation rates because it's considered like, you know, um, I don't know, it's less glamorous. There's sometimes less, fewer requirements for graduate school. And so what that means is like the pay is lower, um, but we're asking them to give up their lives for six months of the year. Um, and that really needs to come with uh, compensation that recognizes that. Yes. Gail, committee member, question. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'll offer my thanks to you all for spending time with us uh, this afternoon, too. Um, I'm wondering, you know, based on what I'm hearing about um, not having enough folks in the workforce and with, with the right skills. Um, and the need to make career opportunities, um, the news about career opportunities more available um, earlier in the pipeline. I'm wondering if any of you have outreach programs or outreach activities that reach into high schools or community colleges. Um, so in Canada, there is a fabulous program that I don't know if there's a parallel in the U.S., but it's called the MyTax program where we can put in about 45% of the money and get half the student's time. And the government puts in 55% of the, the, the student's money. And that allows us to have collaborative programs that that's working really well. Um, we do do a bit of outreach to high schools just when our kids' classes need somebody to talk to them. Um, and the, the other one that has been really successful for us is a program with the Nova Scotia Community College for ocean technology. And so generally speaking, they already have a... Uh, technology program or like a bachelor's in marine biology or marine science. And then they do this ocean tech program. It's a two year, they touch all the different kinds of equipment. They touch multi-beams and they touch CTDs and they, they get a real familiarity with how to maintain these, troubleshoot them, um, build them back up. And that program we've hired numerous people from, it's been very successful. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if there's a parallel to that, but that one, it became out of the fact that the government said, what do you want? What do we need? And we said, we need ocean tax. I said, okay, we'll make an ocean tech program. But that, that's, that's been a really successful one. The Navy um, has a very successful um, um, program that they started about a decade ago. The acronym is um, NREP, uh, the Navy Research Enterprise uh, Program. And it's all about um, uh, getting uh, people young all the way up through a PhD program. So um, we've been very successful in getting talented, hardworking people that way. Uh, and um, it's basically a program that you can access online and you can submit uh, your, uh, your package online. And uh, they have uh, calls uh, once a year, starts in the fall and they make decisions. And then the, 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 um, the, we get as, as a Navy organization, very much like um, even the operational Navy offices, as well as the, uh, um, the other Navy labs can go in and view the candidates um, in the fall. And typically the uh, 
do the selection in the in and around the December time frame. So it's a very it's been a very successful program for us. I'm actually quite surprised at how, how well it's run, um, being something that the, the Navy does, of course, um, which is not always the case. We have the MATE program, which goes into community colleges, but um, the success of getting the word out is there's more places that you haven't gotten the word out than have. Ocean acoustics is a tough one, too, because um, you need a certain level of um, resources to be able to uh, get high school students involved. I know that uh, at Newark and uh, Newport, they have a very good program which gets um, um, low-income high school students from New Bedford involved. Um, and they do make underwater uh, UUV, they make UUVs, uh, small toy UUVs, and, and uh, they go through that process. So to get, get people involved at an earlier age is tough. Um, a lot of the committee has already talked about things that we do. Um, they're not necessarily ocean acoustic based, but they are uh, STEM based. A lot of uh, these people will give time for the, running the robotics uh, team for their high school or something like that. Or tutoring, um, they do a lot of um, STEM-based lower income tutoring, that's something I do. Uh, but it is an ocean acoustic specific. I think you need, you need some infrastructure for that to get people involved. You also need the proximity. You need to be close to something where there's something like that, uh, you know, like a lab available. For those people to come. Well, one of the things that I talk to students about a lot is that you don't have to have a PhD to work in science. Um, science requires everything from IT support to electronic support to da da da. Um, and so I think that one of the things that we should look at doing more is being specific and what we're hiring for in like the task, as Scott mentioned, there are like three different things that we need out of them. We need people who can develop, we need people who can interpret, and we need people with the electronic um, sensor expertise to, to fix them. And so if what we need is someone to fix electronic sensors, do they need to be an acoustician? You know what I mean? To do that. Or could they fix electronic sensors and be like, I want to do that in a field that supports acoustics because that's a hobby I'm crazy about. Um, that's kind of how I got into marine research is I was doing geophysics and I hated it and I realized I could write programs and, and do the overboarding stuff and still support science instead of being a research scientist to do that. And so I think that we could improve our recruitment and retention by being specific in what the skills we need are, where the field is just, you know, interesting and cool, but not necessarily what you're doing in your minutia day to day. I'm going to jump in here with a question um, for the panel members. Industry is very different than academia. Academia has definitely um, elevated the value of DEI in their organizations. And I was wondering, how is DEI perceived and how is that incorporated in recruitment, if it is at all, within your industry? We're very aware of DEI, um, but we don't actively use it as part of recruitment. So we're, we're looking for the people who have the skills we need, um, as opposed to saying, okay, we need a visible majority for this role. Um, so, yeah, I'd say that we're aware of it, in the, especially in the sense of inclusion and making sure people who are here don't feel like they're being discriminated against or aren't part of the team, but it, it's not part of the recruiting. Other than a couple of people said, hey, this slide pack is awesome for showing where people come from. Can we use it for recruiting? But that's, you know, that's the first time I've heard it even remotely considered. We, for DAE, it is, it is considered. Uh, in fact, in the interview process, there is a requirement uh, for that. So um, I think we are taking it pretty seriously in BAE. Um, not just in the interview process, but also uh, having representation at different levels of uh, 
of, of management, different levels of scientific um, um, advancement, I think we do take that pretty seriously. I'm happy to hear that. So, I think we're we're pretty serious about DEI efforts. The our biggest concern is that we have a pretty small footprint in the U.S. and that we want to be more selective and be more um, engaged in DEI, but we get so few applications that we're just sort of stuck with with what we've got. And I think that the burden for us is that we're not reaching those communities with our job announcements in order to say, hey, apply to this. Well, we seem to be attracting the same uh, environment that we have behind us and ahead of us. Um, and so we don't really have the resources either to find where those places are that we can advertise better um, our jobs. And so that's something that would be incredibly useful. I know things like the Equal Society of America job board tends to reach a little bit more of a diverse crowd, but there's got to be better places that we can put our job ads up in order to, to reach a, a, a different group of people. So if anyone has the recommendations, that would be great. That's what this committee is here for. <laughs> one yeah, of one of the things, so my industry is academic, so it kind of bleeds back and forth, right? I'm in support of academic. Um, and one of the things that I notice is, um, as I mentioned earlier, unnecessary restrictions in your like job descriptions. Because if you require a master's degree, why are you requiring that master's degree? And if you look at the demographics of who's getting a master's degree in that field, you're limiting your potential applicants. And if you can get rid of things like master's preferred or PhD preferred, people will not apply because you're only gonna hire the one with a master's or a PhD. Um, and so to really increase who's coming to apply for your jobs, you have to look at what's in your description that's gatekeeping individuals from applying. That's a great point. Could I ask a question? Are you, are you saying that people with master's degrees and physics degrees, I'm sorry, PhD degrees are in fact not of value? No, I'm saying, is that really the requirement for your job? Yes, it is. When we do it, we need PhDs. A lot then of these people are to very, very your job hard description. to solve. Then you don't need to adjust your job description. But if we're talking about analysts and, and that sort of thing, then um, sometimes they are carried in as, um, well, this is what the role was in the past. This is well, what- A lot of analysts have PhDs. A lot of the good ones do. But some of the great ones didn't too. Yeah. It's a lot Brian, I, 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 can, I can speak to sort of both sides of this. I understand where you're coming from in, in the environment that you're in at Navy. But on the other hand, I also, having been a seagoing scientist and been a chief scientist in a lot of UNOLS vessels, I understand where Brandy's coming from, which is that the, the technical staff on those cruises, the people who are fixing the instrumentation that's going over the side, I mean, I come from the USGS, I bring my own, but the point is those people don't necessarily need a master's degree. And, and we're often asking them to have that because it's just an old job requirement as opposed to someone who is a double E undergrad or something who's out there fixing my instrument that person doesn't need to have necessarily an advanced degree if he's got well, he or she's got this the this is true and, this and is I don't true mean... you know how many people in in my shop have PhDs and what what their uh, uh, their background is you know what their skin color is if you want to start talking about skin color I've and got I'm, so many I'm, people I want to jump, who are I want to jump so many here. people are Indian. I we, want to clarify that that doesn't mean that higher, edu higher education degrees are not necessary for all jobs. I'm just saying it's important to look at your job descriptions and make sure that they accurately reflect what your needs are instead of carrying old, unnecessary information. Yeah, I don't want to get too far into the weeds on this topic um, because we're really here to focus on the ocean acoustics education and not hiring practices or anything like that. So um, I, I'm gonna pull it back to the, our statement of task at hand. And um, it looks like we are just about out of time. It is four o'clock by my, my computer. Um, I think we covered a really wide range of topics today amongst the two different panels. I want to sincerely thank all of the, the expert panelists that have come in and shared their thoughts and their opinions and their organizations. Um, now it is the, the committee's job now to take all of this information back and um, make sense of it in a way that improves 
the ocean education, ocean acoustics education to meet all of these needs in the present as well as in upcoming into the future. In your briefing books, um, everybody who received that briefing book at the very end, there is a timeline with a description of how these different panels and surveys sort of factor into the community or to the committee's activities in preparation of this report. So I highly encourage you to look at that um, so you can get an idea of when you'll see um, how all of your comments have been integrated and synthesized, as well as comments from our upcoming panels and from our upcoming community survey that will go out. So hopefully keep your eyes out over the next week or two as our, our community survey, survey goes out related to ocean acoustics for academia, for industry, for government, and for technical societies. Um, so thank you again. Caroline, are there any housekeeping thanks that we, that we need? Um, I just want to echo your um, thank you and um, appreciate the time from all of our panelists. Um, I will send that timeline out to all of the um, panelists that um, has the expectations of when our, our report can come out and we will be conducting um, continued information gathering sessions throughout um, the next several months. Um, please also um, follow our website um, for more information, and I will throw that in the chat here momentarily, um, uh, about this, this study and future um, information gathering sessions. Uh, Dave Bradley has his hand up, too. Go ahead, Dave. Just, just a quick question. Do you, do you have any uh, uh, further requirements for us as part of your initial panels? Nothing further. Um, we will, um, as Jen mentioned, we have a, a community survey that is um, being developed and should be um, released to the public in early May. Um, and I will be, um, if if everyone on the panelists is, is okay with it, we'll be sharing your email addresses with our, our team that developed the survey. So um, that will also go to informing um, this report and the link for our project webpage is in the chat um, to follow the future meetings as well as um, see the recording of um, past meetings under past events. And I would say too, to all of our expert panelists, if there is something that we didn't have time to get to with our very restricted amount of time that you feel is important to express or consider on this topic, please email or in some way connect with myself or Carolyn or anybody else that you may know who is a committee member. We, we want that feedback. We want your ideas. We want your opinions and thoughts. So if there's something that you feel very passionate about, please let us know. Yes, um, just to echo that, everybody has my email address. Please um, send it and I will make sure that information gets shared with the rest of the committee. Awesome. Again, thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of whatever day you may have in whatever time zone you are. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.